Good day, everyone, and welcome back to Tim Topham TV. You're listening or watching episode number 28. And in fact, for this episode, I would recommend you watch because my guest today, the fabulous and amazing Paula Melville Clark, will be sharing a number of her teaching videos. So you can actually watch her teach live. Now, um, it's pretty rare, although it's becoming more common, I guess, for teachers to actually share their teaching online. And I think it is one of the best ways to actually learn more about pedagogy, um, teaching tips, um, and just, just seeing other people in action is so inspiring in so many ways. So I can't thank Paula enough for sharing these videos of her teaching to give you all a great idea about the topic of today's podcast, which is Dal Crow's Eurythmics. Now, Paula is a very well-known Australian music educator. She's an accomplished pianist and a registered classroom teacher, and she's got well over 30 years of experience. She writes and conducts the Music for Kids music and movement programs for children and teaches piano from her home studio in Toowoomba, which is in Queensland, Australia. As a Dal Crows practitioner and experienced musician, Paula is a regular guest teacher at many workshops and conferences in Australia and overseas, and that is in fact how we met in the first place. She's one of the few practitioners in the world applying Dal Crows techniques to instrumental learning and performance, and she has a special interest in working with musicians and teachers in the area of kinesthetic musical response. Her approach to piano teaching and performance is innovative and creative and her research into piano performance and the body is award winning and you'll know exactly why when you see her in action. So this episode is all about Del Crows, uh, the man behind the program and what it actually means uh, and how you could potentially incorporate some of these little ideas into your own teaching. Um, this is part of a series that I'm doing on a number of these uh, teaching systems or methods, including things like Suzuki, Kadai, Orf, uh, and this episode, which is all about Dal Crows. So I know you're going to really enjoy this episode. Make sure you're watching it so you can have a look at the teaching videos um, and uh, get stuck into it, see what you think, and leave a comment too, uh, either on social media or under the show notes, which are at timtopham.com forward slash episode 28. As always, at this time, I would encourage you strongly to leave an iTunes review if you are regularly watching or listening to these podcasts. Just head to timtopham.com forward slash iTunes and all the instructions are there. Uh, it certainly means a lot and it's a big help if you do get the time um, and uh, could pop a review in. Anyway, let's not waste any more time. Let's get straight into the interview and the videos. Here is Paula Melville Clark. <laughs> Paula, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Great to have you here. It's lovely to be here. Thank you very much. Very excited. <laughs> um, so now, Paula, we've just actually watched you in action in a classroom. Um, so I'm really keen to have you just explain a little bit, a bit about what was going on. And for those people who are about perhaps listening to this in the gym or wherever they are, make sure you watch the video because that was actually uh, a video footage <laughs> section. So what was actually going on there and how does it work? Well, those are my youngest piano students. They come once a week to my little studio in, uh, in the city and we do a, an hour and a quarter's dull crows. It's, it's a little bit eclectic, um, but it's basically dull crows with um, some other um, philosophies thrown in. Um, but what you can see there is a very, very simple exercise. The children are simply stepping the beat. Uh, it, it helps them time, space and energy to understand where the beat is in space. Um, when we when we clap, when children clap, usually they'll sort of clap like this. Um, and I call this terminal clapping because it it stops as it hits the hand. It it has no has no quality to it. Um, so in the children in my studio learn to clap this way. They always have the what happens after the beat that leads to the next beat. So and they're doing that now with their feet. And I ask them to 
um, to, to sort of spread out a bit and step it out. Some of the children at first, if you look at the, the little video, you'll see that they're not actually stepping in time to begin with. Uh, but, but they do eventually, you know, so it, it's every child works at their, their own pace um, and with their own ability. Sometimes children are, are just a bit tired and they can't be bothered and they just sort of stomp around and it's, you know. <laughs> but, um, and then I get them to actually put the meter into that, the, the down and the up. In, in Delcros, we always use bilateral arms um, so that we're using both sides of the brain. Okay, um, bilateral meaning both arms moving at the same time. Yeah, both yeah. arms at the same time. Um, so they're, they're then um, conducting as they as they step the time, which is, and and those sorts of exercises go on to um, being able to tap back rhythms as they step the beat. It's very very fundamental basic work, particularly for those children. So All right. Well, I reckon what we've got to do now is go a step back and actually talk <laughs> about what we're talking about. So who is this? I assume it was a fellow, D Dal Crows. That's right. Uh, and what's this method all about? <laughs> well, that's that's very that's a great question because it's quite hard to talk about Delcros as a man um, if you don't link it to Delcros the the philosophy and the, the his approach to music education, also known as Delcros um, and Delcros Eurythmics. Mm -hmm. uh, but in a nutshell, of course, Emile Jacques Delcros was a Swiss composer, um, educator, and philosopher who, at the turn of the twentieth century, devised a method of music education which was initially attended for his conservatorium students in Geneva, but that soon expanded into a methodology for children, um, training of dancers, actors, and, and even into music therapy. So it became very, very broad. Um, the man himself, his mother, Julie, was a, a great musician, and she, she started his musical studies. Uh, he went on to study in Paris with Foray and Delibes. I think later he went to, to um, Geneva work with Bruckner. I don't think that was a very happy um, relationship, <laughs> but, um, but I think he learned a lot there about a very rigid, structured, Germanic approach to education. So it, it was a little bit the making of the man. Um, he later became an accompanist. Uh, he became a musical director in Algiers with all those wonderful Ar Arabian rhythms. So, um, but at the age of 27, he became really quite a young uh, professor of harmony and solfege at the elite uh, Geneva Conservatorium of Music. And it wasn't long before he began to realize that there were great deficiencies in the way his students were being taught. Um, although they were quite technically advanced, I mean, almost virtuosic, because it was a very elite institution, he found that many of them failed to keep a, a tempo or to understand that, that the, the beat is not always down. Sometimes the, the first beat is up. Sometimes the first beat feels forward. Um, and he became very sort of, um, I suppose, um, concerned um, ab about moving his students forward in this, in this kind of um, education they were getting. Um, many of them failed to hear harmonies that they were writing. That means they couldn't sing them. Mm -hmm. um, they, could just, they could just read them and, and could theorize about them, but they couldn't actually um, hear them. And he, he found, too, that many of them played without expression. So he was very dissatisfied by what he saw. So as a very young um, beginning of his career, he decided to do something about it, of course. And he decided in, this, in the Genevan society, which was, which was very rigid in its morality, that he, that he would get them all to kick their shoes off and he'd get them to move around the room and clap and, and, and skip and jump and punch and, and, and sort of move to the music, you know? Yes, this would have been outrageous, I'm sure, at the time. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. outrageous beyond any notion that we could imagine. Yep. Um, so he could see that all meaningful learning needed a synthesis, not just of the, the mind, but of the body and tapping into the emotions. And, and, and in reality, this wasn't a new concept. You know, if we think about Plato, Back in the, the Greek period, he stated that education has two branches um, in laws. And we have gymnastics that trains the body and music, of course, that was designed to improve the soul. Mm -hmm. um, so the education of the whole person had somehow got lost over the centuries from the Greek ideals. Um, so this philosophy, of course, was very, very avant-garde. Yeah. For the time, the Geneva Con was an elite institute. and. As we've already said, this society was never going to accept their young people moving to the music in bare feet and shorts and the girls in Greek 
I Greek um, gym slips above the knee, you know, it was, it was absolutely radical. So, of course, eventually um, he was brought before the board and oh. <laughs> the board, um, I, I read this somewhere and I'm pretty sure it's, uh, it's true and I couldn't actually find the quote, but um, it, it, basically they said to him, what do you want your students to know, Monsieur Delcroze? And he said, I don't want them to know anything. I want them to feel everything. Mm. Isn't that fabulous? Yeah, it's awesome. You know, it's very sad that, uh, unfortunately, they couldn't see beyond their, their sort of rigid structure. And uh, Delcroze moved on from, from that. And it was only later that he came back to Geneva to teach um, in the Delcroze Institute. Um, but he discovered a very, very different sequence of learning. There's a, a great exponent in uh, New York called Robert Abramson. You may have heard of him. I haven't a clue. Uh, uh, he's, he put out a, a good video too, you know, if uh, people want to look up Bob Abramson on the, on the internet. There's a lot of great stuff and books from him. But um, Bob actually uh, summed up that experience comes first and the theory attaches to that later. I mean, it's the way people learn, isn't it? You know, we, mm. we, we hear the mother tongue first. We don't write it, first of all, with sellotape across our mouths, not allowed to speak it so we can write it. So... You know, it's, it's nonsensical, really. Mm -hmm. um, but Bob st stated that, you know, we hear, and what we hear makes us move. And then the moving of it makes us feel something in the muscles. And then that feeling makes us sense. You know, we, we begin to, to, to sense and make sense of what we're doing. So we can analyze what's happening. That analyzing means we can write it on the board. You know, we can write our crotchets and quavers. Uh, it turns into writing. And, and then we can improvise on that if we want and take it into performance. And that's this, sort of the, the sequence. So I guess in, um, gee, we... <laughs> no, no, it's great. This, we need this background. It's great. In, in a nutshell, um, I guess that's there. Um, yeah, so, so it's about, it's about this, the concept of uh, feeling music rather than theorizing and analyzing so much, or at least in the first part. Would I be right in... I'm, I'm generalizing a great deal, obviously, but feeling yeah. and movement. That's absolutely true. And, and of course, you've got to have the society and the, the education knowledge um, and this, of the psychology of education with the people that are delivering education in order to, to be able to have a system of that sort. Mm -hmm. And they simply didn't have it in, in, you know, in the 19th century. I mean, Delcro's inherited... Um, um, a musical system that in schools, for example, it was based very much on choral um, uh, tradition. They sang choral music, mm. um, which is wonderful in itself, and of course we should, but, but not entirely, mm. or not mostly. Um, and the focus was very much on the notation of music. If you could read music and write it, then, you know, oh, you know 10 out of 10. Mm. Um, but it's the sort of intellectualization of, of music. And, and it's very interesting, of course, that Kadai in Hungary and uh, Karl Orff in Germany were coming to very much the same um, understandings in their own countries. So this is this kind of revolution that's happening, this moving forward of music education um, at the turn of the 20th century. And these are the, the factors, I think, that also contributed to Delcro's forming his approach. Um, mm -hmm. So we have... You know, I think there were sort of three, three areas that influenced him um, mostly. There are, there are new movements taking place in education and psychology, particularly in child development, you know, with Piaget and, um, and, and many of the other um, psychologists. We've, at the end of the 19th century, we also had a sort of a breakaway from this sort of stereotypical contrived dance forms, um, founding classical dance. I, mean, I was brought up. Um, you know, I did all my, right up to advance, I did my classical ballet teaching. It's very stereotyped. Sorry, you were a ballet teacher as well? Uh, I was, oh, yeah. Wow, there you go. Um, um, so there's this great freedom of expression that's being manifest through movement. So we have the Isadora Duncan, the, the Ruth Saint-Denis um, at that time, who of course went on and taught um, Martha Graham. And so we've got this new modern dance culture um, coming through at this time. And we've also got psychologists and researchers who are proposing that the nature of rhythm is fundamentally motor. That means it's a motor re response. It originates in the body. Mm -hmm. uh, and I jokingly say to my students, I, I love this one, you know, beginning of a term, new kids. So, um, so what's the definition of rhythm then? Little hand goes up. Um, 
like um, crotchets and quavers. Yeah, well, that's part of it, you know. We, we kind of go on. It's a terrible trick question because they're never going to get it in a pink fit, you know. Um, be, because rhythm is everywhere. Rhythm is, as I'm speaking, there are rhythms there. As, as we're breathing, the rhythms of nature, the rhythms of our world, and the rhythms of the body. And the only reason that children understand rhythm is that they walk and they run and they skip and they... They sway and, you know, it's so... And so, yeah, it's, it's taking some of those very natural movements of, uh, of children and, and allowing them to use that to connect with music, I guess, in some ways. Yeah, that's right, going yeah. from the known to the unknown, which I guess we'll talk more about as mm. we go on. So there's these sort of three factors that, um, that, are, that are really affecting Delcro's, I think, um, and, and leading him and, to, a, to an extent, Orphan Kadai as well, who are doing the same thing in other countries. Mm. Um, I'm interested to know, you mentioned that uh, his theories and ways and practices were of, often considered pretty out there back then. I wonder if you, what's your experience in modern conservatories about getting your shoes off and dancing around in shorts as well? Because my thought is that I, I don't know that a lot's changed in some of them. <laughs> That's a really good point. Um, in some countries in America, for example, I think there's a chair in, of Del Crows. Uh, forgive me if I'm wrong, anyone that's listening that knows better, but there are many chairs in, in Del Crows Eurythmics in their institutions. It's uh, a lot more form there. And sorry, do you mean chairs as in people sitting down to learn it? Oh, I'm sorry, um, a chair, being the chair of Del Crows, like um, having oh, a faculty. okay, okay. Yeah, I think they call them... Yeah, uh, a chair, a, uh, yeah. yeah, leader of the faculty, yeah. Leader of the faculty. Uh, in the in the UK, for example, um, we've got Karen Greenhead, who's in at Manchester, and we've had some some great teachers in many institutions, um, like the um, Royal Academy of Music with Elizabeth van der Spar o over time, with Annie Lennox coming out of that. Um, so, I mean, it's there, there are institutions that do embrace it. Um, in in Australia, it's it's been an uphill battle for um, Delcrosians here. Uh, we did um, originally at USQ, I was um, employed as Delcro's uh, lecturer. And that's we, University of Queensland for those listening. Uh, that's University of uh, Southern Queensland. Southern Queensland, sorry, yep. Based in Toowoomba. Yep. And that was for about five years that we, we actually had a um, full-time program of Delcro's. Um, and we allied that to our junior academy of music, which was a Delcro's based as well. I mean, I think that was radical. And I remember Oster describing that whole program as being one of the, the most exciting and forward thinking projects of, of, the, of the decade. Wow. And I think it was. Um, it was just a, a shame that, uh, that things changed and new people came in and uh, they didn't have that same vision. Mm. Um, so it was lost, um, but, but things go on and institutions are changing because of financial constraints and so forth. And, you know, that's, mm. that's mm. what happens. I, I do remember often looking at having 20 or 30 students in a great big auditorium and we're all laughing and clapping and, you know, moving to the music in our bare feet. And thinking, I do hope the dean doesn't come. By. <laughs> I hope he can wait till we're doing our solfege class. Was, was something that a lot more sort of, you know. Well, I, have to, I have to say, I mean, the, the way we met was I was in one of your classes or two. Actually, I probably went to all of them after I went to the first one because I enjoyed it so much. Uh, at a at a conference a couple of years ago, and it was great. It was we were there in bare feet, moving to very simple music. And throwing things at each other and it was such a great release and just relax like it was just good fun um so i can i can see why kids would totally get into it they can and i think for as a from a pedagogical point of view um it's really important in our institutions that we're teaching the the, the major um major philosophies because mm. otherwise they're going to go out as teachers and just try and reinvent the wheel mm. and Absolutely. so so the three major ones, and there's many others as well that are, that are, are of great interest. Well, my plan is to do a podcast on each of uh, Kadai, Orf, and Dal Crows. Oh, um, and funnily enough, as you were speaking, I, was, uh, I, I, I recorded another podcast this morning about the Suzuki method, um, which will be uh, broadcast shortly after this one, I think. Um, and it was interesting hearing what you were saying about reading 
coming later, talking, talking and moving and feeling and hearing is, is what we should be doing with musicians way before we get them to read. Uh, and it sounds like there's a bit of crossover there with Dale Crozer's thoughts. He's not putting a piece of music in front of anybody right up front. That's right. And Suzuki, Yamaha, they're all, they're all amazing. Mm. I think that's why I'm quite eclectic now. I don't really, I mean, I'm, I am trained in Dale Crows, but I've also brought so many other bits and pieces. When people ask me, I say, oh, and I just teach Paul and Marvel Flart these days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But and I think, I think that's, that's great. And, and the person I was interviewing about Suzuki said the same thing. I thought you actually, for a lot of these methods, you are a Suzuki teacher. That's all you do. And you can't do anything else because you're trained and accredited or whatever. She said, no, no, you know, you can, you, you use the methods to suit the students. Uh, and I thought, th thought that was great. So let's get on to just a little bit about you and, and what you're actually doing these days. Um, are you, do you teach a, an instrument as such or do you teach only classes? What, what, what does a kind of day or a week look like? Um, a day and a week. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a piano teacher. I teach piano and I, I run group classes for children in my Music for Kids studio. Uh, on top of that, I, I do quite a bit of um, in-service training and uh, last year I did a, a, a few fellows in residence in, in, different, in different, different places. Mm. Um, but uh, so my, my students come to a group class once a week, um, which is for little ones, early childhood programs in the morning, that's sort of 45 minutes. It's very movement based. And the same in the afternoons, the children come for their Delcro's based music and movement classes. We cover all the, it's the foundation of their, their studies there. And mostly I take all of those, those things into their piano lessons as well. So I set everything up in their classes and we take that onto the piano, probably to begin with in some kind of an improvisation. I think one of the, one of the videos that we're going to tag onto this um, will we'll demonstrate that, but we'll talk a bit more about that a little bit later on. Mm -hmm. um, so with my, Two-year-olds, for example. Um, two-year-olds, you know, that's amazing. I, I saw them at two. I, I, wow. used, to start, I used to start newborns um, because I have this kind of um, conveyor belt of, of children, you know, right up to my, my Elma's diploma um, piano students. And some of them actually started, <laughs> quite scary thing. <laughs> but I've been teaching here in Australia now at 23 years. Yeah. So, you know, some of them have, have gone all the way through from toddlers right the way up to, you know, to those sorts of levels. Yeah. Um, but, the, you know, with the young child, we focus very much on fundamental movement and rhythms. Um, you know, our traditional nursery songs, they're, they're all focused on fundamental rhythms. And, um, you know, um, what I mean by fundamental rhythms, they connect to what we call fundamental movement. And so we have, of course, binary rhythms and ternary rhythms. And our binary rhythms are crotchets and quavers and semiquavers and accented eights, things that can be divisible by two. Mm -hmm. But for, for the child, they already know all those things. They don't need a name for it. They, they walk, they jog, they can run a bit faster, running faster, running faster. <laughs> yep. quavers, and they can not necessarily skip. They might have a, what we call a one-sided skip, you know, until they start cross-patterning, mm -hmm. crossing the midline. But still, they're still getting that accented eight through them. Um, so all those rhythms are there, and what's what's very very interesting um, uh, about teaching young children is that all the nursery songs that we have, because children when those nursery songs were written used to move more. Uh, I mean, children don't sit like this and sing sing songs; they're they're up and moving. Mm -hmm. So all those songs to a T are based on a fundamental rhythm. So let's take Jack and Jill. Jack and Jill went up. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's accented eights or, or it's possibly ternary, whichever, you know, crotchet quaver, whichever we want. Um, twinkle, twinkle, little star. Twinkle, twinkle, it's just crotchets. Mm -hmm. you know, they, they've already got it. Um, seesaw Marjorie door, what a lovely one for dotted crotchets. You're never going to teach a two or three year old um, the theory of what a dotted crotchet is. You know, let's let's go on the maths of it, shall we? I, I have trouble doing it for fifteen-year-olds. So exactly, yeah. <laughs> but they can feel it. You know, absolutely. They, you know, and they can feel it sometimes holding their parents' hands, sometimes with their parents just holding them, or sometimes we bring props into the the room. So um, a hoop, 
holding the hoop the, and a, a parent holding the other side of the hoop is going to help them to feel the, the time and the space and the energy of that note. So we're, we're working really at really high levels of quality in, in their response to music, um, even at that early age. Um, when we come to three to four year old children, um, you know, those things might go on a little bit further. Um, to, for example, the, the, really the difference between two year olds and three to fours, fours to fives is um, skipping. Um, a child between the age of four and five, sometimes earlier, sometimes a bit later, will start to cross pattern. Um, which What's means, that mean? It means they cross the midline. Um, so we know that the left brain c controls the right hand. We know that the right brain. So, so babies, children will, will use both hands. You know, they, they haven't yet been able to... to, 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 to oh, to uh, separate the, the two separate the separate. halves of their body sort of thing. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, so very often children at three and four won't skip. They'll do a little hop step, you know, kind okay. of all on one side of the body, the dominant side. And bit by bit, they'll, they'll begin to do a hop step on one side and a hop step on the other, which is a skip. Mm. And as a, as a dance teacher for, for years, classical ballet, um, I used to try and force that, you know, it's like, come on, why can't you skip yet? You know, <laughs> step and you'd show them, come on now. No, 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 stay on that leg, hop step. But in actual fact, it's a natural process. And I learned that really once I came to Dalcro's and realized that children skip when they start to cross pattern. And what I love about this work is when I'm playing from the piano and watching my class, I'm able to ascertain which children are having difficulties, which children haven't got very good hand-to-eye coordination, which children are, are probably because they're not skipping yet and say they're six, they're, they're not necessarily tracking properly. So I might often say to the parent after the class, I'm just wondering if little Johnny's um, a slow reading. Oh, yeah, how did you know? Mm. How about we do some scarves, some scarf work that crosses the midline um, or these sort of pattern things where you, you know, you're crossing oh, yes. these little games in body percussion. Um, so um, it's interesting, you know, um, Dalcro's faced a whole problem at the turn of the century but we're, we're facing another problem in, in, our, in our time because we have a challenge in education today where, where many children are just not as active as they were in previous generations. Mm -hmm. They're not getting a lot of this fundamental movement and children are more sedentary and they're more into screen-based entertainment. Um, and there are studies showing that there's a decline in, in children's fundamental movement. Um, so, I mean throwing, jumping, running, skipping, all those sorts of things that, that link to their psychology of their development. Um, um, so it, it would be fantastic, really, if all children were exposed to a movement-based uh, music. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So uh, do you, I gather, so you have, you have your piano students of all ages, I'm gathering, but probably mostly younger. Um, and you have group, group classes with them once a week and you have a one-on-one -on -one lesson, a tr more traditional lesson once a week. And in that lesson, do you use, you know, any particular Dal Crows books or anything like that? Or is that part of it up to you? It's, it's the movement that's about the Dal Crows. Um, oh, no, there are no Dal Crows books as such. Um, so you teach them as you would teach any other student about improvising and music reading, using whatever method, that sort of thing. So that's right. And um, the Dolcros is more of a philosophy than a, a methodology in that there's, there's, not a, there's, there's not a systematic book that says you teach this, you teach this, you teach this. Um, but there are underlying things that all Dolcros teachers do um, you know, sort of at, the, at the same time. Um, so, yeah, I really, I, I just teach like every other teacher, except I probably tap far more into their kinesthetic sense. So I would, for example, if a, if a student was finding it difficult to, uh, let's say a rhythm, um, let's say a, a triplet rhythm, you know, trio, a it's a little triplet, mm -hmm. triplet, and they were finding that hard, um, you know, perhaps in more traditional teaching methods, you put a big circle around it, try and get children to clap it, you know, you might even do some really nice things like this. But there's still, it's still not what we call kinesthesia. It's still not, it's still not uh, motor. It's not large movement of the body. So I would just, um, I'd probably play at the piano. I'd ask them to stand up and just step me a crotchet as I play the piano. 
And then I'd ask them to do run along, run along, run along, run along. Because and, and run in time, run in time. Run in time, yeah. yeah. And, and that goes right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left. It's going either side of the body, which is why it's a difficult uh, rhythm to do. It's, it's, what we, it's, um, it's not symmetrical. Yes. It's, a, it's, a, uh, yeah. Symmetrical. Yeah. it's a symmetrical rhythm. And so it's why it's often, if, it's, if the child has a problem with it in the body, the child's not going to be able to play with it. Mm. Do it any, anybody. Um, Dal Crow's actually said that every musical problem is solved in the body. It has to be solved first in the body uh, because we can't just come to the piano and put the fingers on and suddenly think, you know, fingers crossed, um, will they get those triplets right? Because they, they won't. They won't have the flow. Uh, yeah, I, I want to ask you about a student of mine, actually, who um, can play quite competently. It, it, he's um, sort of, he's, I don't know, 15, 14, 15, probably been learning for about three or four years. Uh, and we have worked really solidly on feeling a solid sense of pulse. Uh, he tends to find it quite difficult um, and if a piece of music, so I'll play him some music and uh, I'm a bit old school, I need to learn more from you, but I'll get him, you know, just, just clap, clap, clap a pulse and if it's dance music or something, totally fine, but give him something with less of a rhythmic feel, very hard sometimes for him to actually feel it in time. Um, and so what I want, I've got two questions for you, so should, would that be better for me to get him up and actually moving to the music to sense to sense pulse if that's an activity that I want to do, and secondly, what about for students and this kind of ties in who you know they can play quite well, but if they miss a beat, they won't realise. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like you're, you're listening to it, it's all going really well, and then they miss a beat for some reason, and they keep on going, and but they don't know that they've done it. Whereas as a teacher, you're listening to it, going, "Oh, we're out of time now," and yeah, yeah. Uh, there's That's kind of very... two, two different questions. So maybe you answer perhaps the first one. Yeah, um, I, 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 love, I love the second one. It's like a Del Crow's game, isn't it? You know, you've <laughs> got to miss a beat to the third bar, you know, but you've got to keep going. It's, it's very clever if they were doing it on purpose. <laughs> yeah, if only. <laughs> yeah. So, so getting I, students out of the piano bench and moving, is that a good idea generally? With 15-year-olds who've never done it, especially males, they can sometimes be a little bit resistant to it. Mm. Um, I've, I've never found that because Dulcro's classes are fun. And when you're with other guys who are 15 and you come in from your football training and you're all doing it, it's, it's really quite cool. Right. But it would depend on him. And yeah. the other thing is that not everybody is, has a dominant, they're not dominantly kinesthetic. You know, he may be more dominantly visual, more dominantly, um, have a more dominant auditory. You know, we talk about VAK being the three dominant, sensory systems of learning, visual, auditory, kinesthetic. Mm -hmm. Kinesthetic is one that we, we tend not to tap into. Um, kines meaning body and thesia being awareness of. Um, so, so they can be a little bit resistant to it, but I'd definitely try it. Um, but it's not just about getting up and saying, let's just walk this beat. I'll play, because I'm sure you, know, you can improvise really well. Um, it, it's not just about, about that. It, it might be about sitting in a chair and saying, I'm going to play a tempo and I want you just to feel it somewhere on your body. So it might just be head. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's really listening when you start to isolate part of the body. Um, and then you could, you could sort of change the music a bit, maybe modulate and go slightly faster and do this one and, you know, do it differently. We might click this one. Now, now, now tap your foot to this. Um, so sort of listening and, so he's actually bringing together his, his listening and reacting, um, but in a kinesthetic way. Mm -hmm. And that could very well turn into to walking. Um, one of the things ab about tempo is that we only ever hear the beat, the beat, the beat. Um, and, but until we start to know that the, the beat is nothing, it's, it's, the, it's the length of the beat. It's the bing to the next beat. And that's where we get into what we call time, space, and energy. Once you start walking a beat, sometimes people will walk like they always walk. Um, and sometimes they've got to learn to make their stride smaller to go faster or longer to, to actually be able to feel the tempo. Mm -hmm. And what, what I find with my, even my more senior students, I mean, working for diploma in higher grades, is that they know exactly the tempo they want to do. But when they get into an exam or you know, in a Stefford or a competition of some sort, concert, they play at a totally different tempo to the oh, one yeah. they're going to. 
So what we do is we, we learn not what that sounds like, but how it feels. So backstage, they, they'll just walk that tempo. And if, you know, I know uh, with the metronome exactly what my stride is with each, with each one, whether I've got to go slightly bigger than my stride because I've got little legs. <laughs> so all of those things may well help your 15-year-old. I hope that mm. answers that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. I've forgotten the sec the second question was... Um... It's, it's really about meter because, yes. you know, we, we have tempo and we have beat. Um, but the next sort of subject, if you like, that, that I work on is meter. We then take those beats and we, we, we've got to be able to put them into what we call bars. Um, but we're not necessarily going to call them that yet. Uh, Karen Greenhead, when she came to, Aus to Australia to do some summer schools years ago, um, probably 15 years ago, she came for about three years, and she brought with her one of the things, because she's, she's actually head of uh, Delcro Studies in the UK, and, and absolutely brilliant. She brought this concept of the, um, the gymnastic ball. Right. <laughs> and it wasn't something I'd done before. And so she'd start playing, and we'd all walk around. There'd be about 40 or 50 people in this huge, big auditorium. And just holding the ball, it's like, hey, what are we going to do with the ball, you know? And then it was every time you feel a downbeat, bounce the ball. Ah, so you'd bounce it. Oh, four beats. Oh, you bounce it on everyone. Ha <laughs> ha, it's mm -hmm. easy. You know, ah, look at everybody. She would change the meter. Everyone would keep going. Two, three, and it would be, oh, that doesn't feel right anymore. Let's work out what we're doing now. So it's that kind of sense. I think until you learn the, how it feels, how different meter feels. And so we're talking two beats, three beats, four beats, five beats six, seven, mm -hmm. um, mixed, mixed bar time, um, you know, the Hungarian rhythms and so forth. Um, all of those things are Delcro subjects. So I, mm. I, maybe that's a, get a, get a ball in your yeah. studio. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I like I like the idea. I just I, I love the the con the concept of mixing music, getting people to understand music by moving moving their bodies. I, it does make sense. I want to go back to um, the dotted crotchet beat um, because this is something we all struggle with from time to time. I have a feeling that some teachers will feel like they're not teaching effectively if students are being shown how to feel that beat rather than be able to metrically subdivide it and understand that that's a crotchet, dot a crotchet and a quaver and that's a one end, two end sort of thing. Do you know what I mean? Yes. How do you um, coach teachers in that respect? Or is it important to do both? We do both, yeah, of course. Okay. Um, but, it, but it comes from the body first. So uh, with the, my, probably five, six year olds, we're probably doing a dotted crotchet. We, we're doing sways, we're singing seesaw, Marjorie, we're singing all these little songs, you know, that, um, so then they, they understand it. The next thing, of course, is to draw it up on the board, to draw a nice big dotted crotchet on the board. Uh, and then I might play a little game with them where they're all, when they hear that, they've just got to walk the dotted crotchet. But when they hear the division into three little beats, they've got to find little groups of three and all run to it. <laughs> run so they've already learned this sort of division of the, the beat. Right, right. Um, and, and in time, of course, that becomes a dotted crotchet. It becomes a dotted crotchet when it needs to be a dotted crotchet. Mm. They become three quavers when they need to be three quavers. Um, I actually um, bring in the, um, the Kadai work as well. My dotted crotchet becomes tam before it becomes a dotted crotchet. And, it, and, it be, and it's T, 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 of course, before mm. it becomes quavers. So it's, it's all part of it. And, of, of course... Um, along with the with the, the Delcro's work, there's all the theoretical side of the training as well. Uh, so Delcro's actually has three three parts to to its training. It's a very complete system. We think of it as being moved to the music, but that's that's only the the, the rhythmic side of the classes. There's also solfege, which is the ear training part of of the Delcro's work, mm -hmm. which is uh, which is um, uh, it's a seba, it's a do, um, fixed Fixed dose system. And that's a, a sol, solfege is a Kadai theory, isn't it? Concept or not? And, and I've sol, always associated them um, with Kadai. Solfa is Kadai. Solfege, because it's French, is, um, is Kadai. Now, uh, sol, did I say? Did I get that right? Sol, yeah, no, no, you did. So Solfa, Kadai, <laughs> Solfege, Delcroze. Is that right? 
other way around. The French solfege is okay. French, yeah. Um, so sol solfege is a fixed dose system, and that's not because Delcro has decided, oh, let's do a fixed dose system. It's because do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, si, do are the names of the notes in French. So right. si is always do. Yeah, oh, I, I, see, okay. I studied and worked in France for five years, so <laughs> I, I, I taught in do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, si, do. Um, but it's hard for Kadai people where do can be any note. That's um, it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a fixed do system based on um, the, the very first thing that we teach the children is to, to hear a semitone and to recognize a tone. Once they, and through movement again. So da da has this kind of contracting feeling it. Do re has this kind of expansive feeling. It's all about how it feels, you know. Right. Um, the falling and showing that in the body yeah and they have to show so I, I, I again I can mark everybody in the class so I might do um, a falling semitone da, da, and they all do a tummy ache one oh, you know and we'll laugh and then da, da, which is the ha ah, yeah you know, kind of, so they all do the actions to it and I can see which children get it right which you know at all, all times they, it doesn't matter and that would be brilliant because I can instantly see how that would uh, relate to someone's ability to play music that adds tension. They, they understand it. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Mm. And of course, the third, the third aspect of the, um, the Del Crow's approach is improvisation. So we actually do separate improvisation classes. Uh, so part of my classes with the students, with the children is, is, is improvising, improvising with the body, you know, their ideas, getting percussion instruments out and then taking that one step further when they come to their their, their class uh, their piano lesson where we'll improvise uh, on the piano things that we've done right. and everyone can see that in one of the videos that we're going to tag at the end oh great great um <laughs> now what about if you've got a tiny tiny little studio as i know a lot of people have it sounds like it's great we're going to have lots of movement and running around and things what happens if there's no space that, that is an issue. Um, it's still space. You know, there's still things that you can do within the philosophy. Mm -hmm. And if it's one-on-one, -on -one, how much space do you need? And there's always a front door and go out in the go car outside. park. Or, you know, the number of times I've grabbed someone and said, let's just, let's just go walk around the garden. Let's go down the road and do this. Let's... Yeah. <laughs> so there, there's, there's ways and means if, um, you know, people want to, I guess. Mm. Okay. So uh, understanding that um, to be a Dow Crow's <clears throat> excuse me, teacher requires, was, requires training. Um, it sounds like there's a few things perhaps that we could chat about now that teachers could actually explore in their lessons on a basic level. Um, we've talked about a few of them already, but what are some ideas that teachers could incorporate now into their lessons that have a bit of a Dale Crow's philosophy without, you know, going too much into the training sort of thing? Is that, is that, is it possible or is it like, no, you really need to know what you're doing? It, it is. Um, I think um, it's it's such a huge subject, really. And when we when we look at the fact that it, to to actually become a, a qualified Dalcro's exponent, it's a four year course wow. overseas overseas course to be, to get a licentiate um, and or to get the the acclaimed diplôme, which only two people in 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 our country have. Uh, is to study uh, in, in Geneva at the Institute. The, w when you look at it in that context, you, you realize um, how much must be involved. Mm. And, and it is such a wide subject and it, it does re require a lot of skills. Um, I, I guess, you know, some of the, the, the problems um, with Del Crows is we don't have enough teachers, we don't have enough exponents, and a, a lot of that is because the certification requirements are extremely demanding and this seriously restricts the number of people who are going to get involved or when they do who actually carry on with the training mm. uh, we have no full-time course here in australia but there are workshops and summer schools and basically people have just got to keep going keep going till they work up their hours um, and that's on top of having a, a music degree or a, a degree that's accepted um you know by the board yeah. Of the council to begin with, so it's it's very very long. So to be able to start to to throw out you know sort of random ideas in a nutshell is is, is very difficult. And I I I really encourage everybody 
that that's, that's listening to this to, to really experience dull prose. Go to a workshop uh, and be, because you will learn so much even in a two hour workshop. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't speak for two hours and convey that. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it is, it's about the experience of it. And, and Dal Prose himself said there are no books that, you know, you can't read a book to learn this. You've actually got to get up. And he was, he was very, very critical of people that would come in and watch um, and, 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 and discuss his, his philosophy. He'd say, unless you get up and experience it, you cannot understand it. Mm -hmm. And I've been lucky enough to, as you, as you know, enjoy one of these workshops. They are uh, few and far between. In a, well, as far as I know in Australia, I don't know if they're that regular, but I'm not as connected as you are. How do people go about finding out in their area about Dal Crow's workshops? They, they are few and far between. And uh, I would suggest that people get onto the Dal Crow's Australia Facebook. Okay. And there's also a Dal Crow's Australia website and there, there will be information there, but probably the most important thing would be to make contact with Sandra Nash, who's Director of Studies in Sydney. She's a brilliant exponent of this work, and, and uh, she, she taught me. I'm enormously grateful to what she gave me. Um, I'm enormously grateful also to, to, to Joan Pope, who's now President of Dalcros Australia. Um, she's, I've known her for many years, and they're both so different in their approach and what they do. Um, and both have a, a brilliance. There are, there are other younger uh, people coming through now that, that um, teach into those workshops. So um, I'd suggest that that's what people do. Okay. There are some great books. Um, there's um, this, this book here. Um, I don't know, can you actually see that there? Yeah. Got that. Yeah. That book, uh, Rhythm One on One, is, um, is a book by um, Julia Schnebly Black and Stephen Moore who both did PhDs in Delcros. And it's, it's quite unique because it's Delcros activities in the private music lesson. Okay. And I, I know that book is that, available that sounds good. Yeah. in amazon.com. Great, we'll put a link to that in the show notes. Yeah, yep. I've also got a book um, which you probably know, which um, perhaps for people teaching younger students, uh, Music, Moving and Learning in Early Childhood. And this book um, has um, the theory at the beginning of, of how we teach young children a movement-based curriculum. And the middle part of it is all lesson plans of for the year. Oh, so wow. it's, it's very, very simplistic. You know, it's, it's, it's presuming that people are emerging teachers, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it gives people, you know, um, a, a step-by-step step sort of thing. That's right. Yeah. And at the back, there are a number of traditional nursery songs and also songs that I've written myself that are, are based on fundamental rhythm and movements because they're quite hard to find. Mm, I bet. Where do people find that book? Is that on Amazon? Uh, it, is a, it is available on Amazon, but um, you'll pay a lot of, um, but just of, um, to pay more, just, just um, contact me. Okay. Well, for people in, uh, I've, obviously we've got listeners in the States and all sorts of places. So uh, I was going to ask as well, I assume there's Dal Crow's organisations in every country. For listeners in London, they, they can find a local person too. That's right. Dal Crow's UK, Dal Crow's US, yeah. and of course the Geneva Institute as well. If they look at Geneva, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff online. Yep. Um, okay. Uh, so look, um, I've kind of covered most of the questions that I had, uh, Paul, which is great. Um, I guess one trickier question might be, um, you know, there's a lot of great uh, methodologies out there. And we've talked about Suzuki, we've talked about Kadai, Dal Crows, Orf, uh, Yamaha, <laughs> and lots of them. How, how do we as teachers work out what bits of which we should use or what suits us best? Like, it's so difficult, isn't it? There's so much out there. There is, and I, I think you summed it up in that statement, what suits you best, you know, because you've got to be true to yourself. You've got to be authentic as a teacher. You can't, nobody can try and be me. I can't try and be you. It's, you know, teachers put forward what they're good at and what they're comfortable with. Mm. Um, and, but I think as long as it comes from meaningful uh, reading and understanding, um, uh, and I, I, for, for me, coming from academia and, and teaching philosophies of music um, and teaching pedagogy, uh, I, I would just hope that people will, will at least try all of these uh, methodologies. There may be one that just knocks you for six. Mm. I, I can remember being uh, invited to my first Del Crow's workshop 
And I actually, um, it was by Laurie Leppard, who was the then head of music at USQ when I was studying there. And he just gave me this flyer and said, oh, I can't think who to give this to. You'd probably be the right person. And it was in Sydney and I thought, well, I might go along. So <laughs> I flew down to Sydney and, uh, and it was a two week summer school and I was running a little bit late. I think my flight got in late and I got my suitcase and I was, it was uh, at the University of New South Wales. And I, I came to where I thought it was and I opened the door and I thought, no, it couldn't be possibly be in there. And I sort of walked away and stopped because what I was seeing was this music was da da dum ba da dum ba da bum. It's like this sort of tango music. <laughs> and all these people are walking around da dee dum ba da dee dee da dum and doing this da dee dum ba da. Thinking, no, it can't be that. It's got to be much more serious than that. And even from my dance perspective, you know, I, I still came from a fairly classical background where the hands were in a certain position and the, the toe had to be in a certain, you know, and one helped itself. And uh, so and I thought about it for about 30 seconds and I thought, it, it is that, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought, oh, well, in we go. Uh, so, you know, went. it was just huge fun. I've mm -hmm. made so many friends and, um, you know, colleagues over the years that I've been involved in Del Crows and seen, for, I mean, for me, it, it just blew my world apart. It blew away all of the, my previous ways that I'd taught. And I just had to restructure myself. And I wasn't very good at it when I first started. All I did was basically try and imitate what I'd learned at that workshop. It was like I was just running ahead of my students. But over time and um, working with more exponents like Karen Greenhead in the UK, um, Lisa Parker, um, at Longy School of Music in Boston and m many others, I, you begin to take a little bit from all of them and you begin to create things and get, get better at it uh, until you're confident. And in fact, until you're improvising and being creative yourself. Mm. So, yes, yeah, so do, do what feels best for, everyone has to do what feels best for them. Mm. And mm. actually moving to the music is not gonna feel best for everybody. Mm. Yeah, that's right. But I think you're right in saying, look, go, go out and explore as, and that's why I love doing these podcasts. It's all about exploring, sharing these ideas. There's great ideas out there, but go and immerse yourself if you can in workshops. Uh, and I hope, I know there's some people that uh, organize conferences that listen to this, and I hope they get people doing workshops on Dow Crows and Kadai and everything for that matter. Because it is, you know, it's a great opportunity when you've got all these piano teachers together at a conference to yeah. show them some different, different concepts. I love it. That's great. Okay, well, look, um, I'm going to wrap it up. Before we talk about the videos that you've um, you've really kindly shared with us, thank you so much for doing that because I know how much teachers love seeing other teachers teach. So um, we'll get you to explain those three videos in a second. But did you want to, um, was there anything we missed in our discussion that uh, was crucial or did we cover most of the bases? I think we pretty well did. Um, I don't know, Tim, did you come to the, the, the Baroque dance workshop that I did, the Delcro's Baroque dances? I don't, I don't think so, no. Uh, it was, I, I think um, there's, there's a lot of offshoots to Del Crows and, you know, we, we tend to think, oh, it's a, it's a way of teaching music and, and yes, it is, but the philosophy takes us beyond and Del, Del Crows loved um, dance forms and the history of dance and folk dancing as well. Um, and I, I thought it would be nice just to to talk about the the, the baroque dances to finish because it's one of my passions sure. and i i did i've done a few workshops with people like um stephen osborne who's oboist he wasn't with the victorian orchestra at the time i did a uh, a little master class with him at at a workshop we were both teaching at uh and he, he i think he played um i think he might have done a sarah band and a, a jig and we we looked at those dances and he didn't dance them perhaps like Fiona Garlic of the, the Sydney um, early dance company would have done, but he got such a feel for the dances and then took it back. And this is, this is actually what we call applied rhythmics. And it, it's a field where you can, you can take your music where you're at and you can work with a Delcro specialist and you apply rhythmics to it. It's very, very exciting. Um, so it's, um, yeah, I thought, I thought that might be something. Brendan Joyce, I did one with Brendan, you know, the camerata. Mm -hmm. 
um, and Oster and so on, a wonderful string player. We did the Baroque dances with him. And we looked at the shape of the Baroque dances and, and, and how it changed his performance. So although we think of, you know, moving to the music, it also, with, with little kids, it al also has this very um, um, sophisticated application as well. Um, so, so there are no boundaries of age um, or of levels. Right. You can apply okay. it to absolutely anything, which, uh, which I, I find Young great. beginners, older, advanced, teenagers, everything. Absolutely, yeah. 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 That's a great way to finish too. Okay, so tell us about these videos that uh, you've been able to put together and that we'll, uh, we'll be linking to, or we might even just pop onto the end of this, this conversation. Um, the first one's a classroom activity, is that right? It is. I might to just talk about the applied rhythmics one first, as we're yeah, just sure. thinking about that. Um, this is a little girl who's, um, I've only had her for a year, and she's actually done two piano exams in a year. Um, wow. So, so quite, uh, quite focused. Um, her family are musical as well, so I'm very happy with her, her progress. But of course, she's not been playing very long. She's very young. Uh, so, um, this was one of her little exam pieces that she played. It's very short, and after she played it, we, we worked on it away from the piano. I felt that she, she, she wasn't really putting a lot of dynamic contrast into the piece. It was very heavy. Um, and I also felt it didn't have flow in the middle section. It was, was kind of very to the beat. So we, we did some exercises and, um, and then all I, away from the piano, of course, um, according to the philosophy. Yeah. And, and then I just said to her, would you like to go back now and, and play what we've just done? So and she did, and I, hopefully people will see a, a difference in the two performances. So, so, so very, very, very quick fix. A lot of people think, oh, it must take so long. You've got to get them away from the piano, and you've got to do this. It isn't. It's such a quick fix. If you, if you try and change flow, and remember that that um, rhythm, eurythmics, is actually is a word that comes from the Greek. You meaning good rhythm, rhythmos meaning flow. So. It's, it's not about arithmetic, it's about rhythmic flow. Um, so that's, uh, it would have taken a long time if I just tried to um, Any other way. theorize with her, intellectualize yeah, yeah. with her. I've just made a connection too. You, did you say Annie Lennox at the yeah. start? And her band was called Eurythmics, of course. That's right, oh, yeah. how interesting. Yeah. Yeah. She's with um, Elizabeth Van der Spar, I believe, at the Royal Academy of Music. In, <laughs> okay. in the Thank you. 
did. We took a big step. Big step. Da, 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 da. <laughs> okay, do the tap from the beginning. Let's talk about video two. And video two, um, the, the first section of it is all the kids in class. And we're doing a missed beat activity. So eight, eight little quavers, five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, four, five. I love this notion of to the side because eight is never straight to one. Eight actually has to get to one. There's time, space and energy. So we're tapping our little claves and then we put certain beats in. So, you know, five, eight, and, and then the children decide which ones we're going to put in. So there's a bit of improvisation with it, and you'll see that. One to eight. 
three. I like it. Let's do it. Are you ready? One, two, three, four. Be ready. Some people aren't ready. Got to do it all together. Get ready. And we're going to do number one. And then the, the, the follow-up footage is one of the children in that class, I videoed the beginning of her class, which was, hey, you know, how did you enjoy doing the Miss Beats? Was that fun? How about we do it on the piano? Mm -hmm. and, and so I, I play eight beats and she has, to, she has to actually play with me on certain beats. First of all, the beats that I give her, and then over time she, she creates her own little syncopated um, rhythm that she she wants by choosing which numbers and of course one three five and seven are really easy but two four yep. six and eight are quite difficult and then if you have one and eight uh, so th those are the two little activities they're easy to do and I, I, I hope you know perhaps teachers would even they'll have a, a little activity that they can take back into the classroom yeah that's great the next yeah. term yeah fantastic Let's write about this. Do you know you're absolutely right? You're very clever. 
I thought I could trust you to remember. I think that's the apartment link all the way up to here. Where's a pen gone? Here it is. I think that's the apartment link all the way up to the top of the stairs. Did you? And the bottom. So we had T, 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 T. So really these are... How many beats in the bar? Two. How many crotchets? Four. Four, four. So it's four beats in the bar, and we're doing T, 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 T. So really, one, this is number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So let's just play the crotchet, shall we? One, and three, and five, and seven. Are you ready? the little half of the beat that isn't usually accented for the beat. So here we go, I'm going to give you eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Four, five, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, 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 four, five, six, seven, eight. Choose which are the syncopated ones, the second half, the way we don't normally. Four, eight. So two, four, six, eight. <laughs> yep. <laughs> the second, the fourth, the sixth, and the eighth little quote. So which one should we have? You want four and eight, do you? Yeah. Oh, clever. So you're going to do number four and number eight. So you're not going to do anything on one, two, three, and then four, and nothing on five, six, seven, eight. Let's try that then, shall we? Here we go. One, two, And the last video uh, was about a piano, a segment of a piano lesson. That's it. So we had three. The first one's the little girl with the applied rhythmics class, and the other two are separate videos at the moment. You maybe maybe you can link them together, Tim. Oh, um, you've just talked about the two of those. And those are the, those are the two. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. fantastic. There's three segments in all. All right, I'll try and run them together. We'll work it out later on. Anyway, <laughs> sure. oh, that's great. I really appreciate you sharing it. I love this. The, the concept of an open door when it comes to teaching, I think, is so, so important. Um, and people learn so much from it. So I really, yeah, appreciate you putting it, putting yourself out there for other people to uh, watch. It's great. Thank you. It's been lots of fun. Mm, yeah, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And I look forward to, uh, you know, we'll catch up. Next time I'm, I'm in Toowoomba and I'm thinking out loud, I'm not sure when I'm <laughs> next planning to go to Toowoomba, but... <laughs> I did have a good time there a couple of years ago when I was at the conference. It was great. <laughs> and thank you, Tim, for your, for your blog and for your website. I mean, you're doing fantastic stuff um, informing teachers and 
and it, you know well done I, re I really enjoy listening to, oh, to you your much. videos that the alexander one i haven't quite finished watching it yet but uh, with greg so yeah. Well, and, and another person that I met at that same conference too. And I had a great time just exploring all these ideas. So uh, I love, love sharing things. So no, I appreciate your feedback. Thank you. It's great. All right. Well, I reckon we'll sign off there. Thanks again. And um, we'll keep in touch. We'll see you soon. Very good. Thanks, Tim. Okay, bye. Bye-bye.